Jazz Forest Studies was a project that was started under the auspices of Mr. Kandaraji and certainly along with many others. And in a nutshell, the goal is to really have a premier uh, organization that's focused on policy, both in the context of India and the diaspora, and issues that are relevant not only to our ability to forge not an identity, but at the same time, what are the issues? When you look at what the objective of this organization is, we want to be the organization that people look to for premier understanding of our issues, the pragmatic policies that forge India's identity in the world, and as a part of that, in the context of how people perceive Indo-US relationships, we want to be able to put in perspective the position of that. There are many events that we've done. Uh, we've hosted events in Washington, D.C. We've hosted events in the Bay Area. We've had topics ranging from Indo-Afghan relationships. We've also talked about the Grameen community, the Fiji um, diaspora, and that whole aspect of all of that. When Prime Minister Modi had come to the uh, United States and he was hosted in Washington, D.C. on the sidelines of that, uh, the Foundation for Indian Diaspora Studies was also um, uh, one of the premier organizations that was hosting events. It got a lot of attention and a lot of well-known uh, named and attendees were in presence. We've also done many, many surveys and right now Foundation for Indian Diaspora Studies is also focused on coming back and creating a policy survey, specifically on Modi 2.0 and the context of how the diaspora perceives this relationship to be forged ahead. One of the key takeaways of this is to have a thought-provoking dialogue. And, and when we mean thought-provoking, it is to look at subject matter experts who will come before you and talk about issues from a perspective, a paradigm. And, and we believe that these conversations will lead further to your own thinking of ideas and values and propositions in terms of what we believe the diaspora is very, very important. Today's topic is no different. And that is in the spirit of what we want to present before you. Uh, when Kandarauji uh, often talks about this, he talks about this with a sense of passion. And the sense of passion comes back from the fact that as we as Indian Americans live in the United States, our immigrant journey is looked at through the prism of many other people. Our goal is to present the facts, the information, to share, to disseminate to everybody else to ensure that the correct perspective is mentioned, it's thought-provoking, it's intended to challenge the status quo, and we hope that the work that we do, in conjunction with all of you, will help forge the paradigm of Indo-US relationships in the context of how it should be looked at. So I know Rocky's got a program uh, for this evening planned, and what I would ask each one of you to do is to sign up, become a member, and just ask for information. And for a nonprofit, we work off of the funding of people such as you to help make sure continue to do all of the work that we think we should do with your help. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Yogi. So um, now without uh, uh, further ado, I'd like to introduce our uh, honored speaker. Uh, he is uh, a crusader for anti-corruption. Um, he's a role model for, uh, for all of the officials, government, and, and otherwise across India. He was nominated as Man of the Year by Times of India during two consecutive years by Vijaya Karnataka for two years. He was nominated as Indian of the Year by NDTV 2011. He has served as Advocate General of Karnataka, Solicitor General of India, and the Justice of the Supreme Court of India uh, from uh, 1999 to 2005. Uh, he was appointed as the Loka Yukta of the state of Karnataka and served from 2006 to 2012. Um, he has been awarded honorary doctorates by five universities, uh, and he's given over 1,100 lectures around the world uh, representing India and in the judiciary. Um, please uh, help me welcome uh, Justice Santoshi. <laughs> United States to give lectures, but in 2006 
2016 when I came to USA. Non-resident Indians requested uh, me to speak to them about the Karnataka Lokayakta institution from which I had retired at that point of time. I did hesitate a bit to speak there because uh, my experience was a uh, Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Uh, my experience in Karnataka Lokayakta was somewhat negative, and I was a little hesitant to speak about the negative part of India outside India. But then I was persuaded uh, by the locals in Houston, which I visit very often, so also in San Francisco, because my brother is here. I have a sister in uh, Houston. Uh, so they persuaded me to speak to them about the Karnataka Lokayakta Institution which I did in 2016. And this time when I was there, again they requested me to speak on a, a different subject altogether. This was more about post-2019 elections in Karnataka. I'm not a politician, never been one, and too late to be one now. Uh, I have, as a matter of fact, uh, proved the fact that I'm a political in the sense that uh, I have in my report to the government of Karnataka named three chief ministers of three different political parties, so I have no affiliation with any political party. But being a citizen of a democratic country, I have a role to play in democracy. Uh, every citizen has a role to play in democracy. To that extent, uh, I'm involved in the politics also, uh, of uh, voting and expressing my views about for or against what is happening in the uh, country, about the policies of different political <coughs> parties, uh, such like things. You know. Beyond that, I have no political connections. Yes, I did uh, mention when I was uh, requested to speak here that I'll speak about the Karnataka Lokayakta uh, experience of five years, which is something uh, totally different from my experience in the judicial field. Uh, but then I, well, there was a request uh, saying that I should speak about the Indian judiciary also. I said, if uh, Indians in the United States want to know about the Indian judiciary, I'm prepared to speak. I'm not here to come and denigrate the institution. But somebody wants to speak about it, I'm going to speak about it, uh, and I'm prepared to answer questions. What time does the basketball final start today? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just, just, just to uh, adjust my. Uh, um, such as you want to. It started a while ago. Who is it? It's going on. It's oh, going on. Yes. Uh, well, I have no choice there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I intend speaking for about half an hour. And then I'll spend another half an hour with you answering your questions. What are your questions? I don't mind. <laughs> I'll try to be brief, even though if I uh, otherwise speak about the Karnataka Lokayakta, it may go on for a long time, which of course I don't want to do here. Well, coming to the institution of Karnataka Lokayakta, I would like to place before you that I've, uh, as Rakit said, you know, I've worked in very many different organizations. I was a judge also for a short period of you know, six and a half years. Uh, but I think. Uh, in retrospect, having experienced what happened in Karnataka Lokayakta, I very often feel that until I came to the institution of Karnataka Lokayakta, I was a frog in the way. I did not know the realities of life. I was holding big posts and uh, I, pictures were presented to me were entirely different from what in reality it was. You know. So consequently, I developed an attitude of saying everything is hunky dory there is nothing wrong with the system and the system is going very well right now. But when I came to the institution of Karnataka Lokayakta, I found so much of suffering to the people. Uh, that too from the hands of an institution created under the Constitution of India called the government. Again, I repeat that I'm not a politician. I've seen government of A party, B party, C party, I've seen. I've dealt with them and I have given reports about those political parties when they misuse their power in the administration. Karnataka government, at least, and all that. In that background, uh, I was also invited to join a movement in India called the India Against Corruption, which was headed by Mr. Anna Azare, which was uh, basically for creation of a strong ombudsman at the center, similar to the one that was there in the state of Karnataka. Uh, the institution of ombudsman in India, at least an effort to start such an institution, started way back in 1960s. When well, then the government of India made a representation or rather request to the first administrative reforms commission to advise the government of the day how to tackle corruption and maladministration. That indicates the fact the government of the day in 1960 recognized the existence of corruption and maladministration. The 
Administrative Reforms Commission, ARC for short form and all, did an international survey and uh, found out that the system prevailing in Scandinavia, which you know is a union of four countries, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, was the best system that was available. And uh, for over 100 years at that point of time, they had an ombudsman system uh, which controlled the administration of all the four nations. You know. And uh, there's an organization called Transparency International in Germany, uh, which uh, started uh, assessing the honesty levels of various governments in the country, in the, na in the nation and world, and started giving them rankings. Ever since that started, somewhere in 1980s, you know, the first rank, one, two, three, four, went to Scandinavia. Scandinavia is considered the most honest country uh, and the best administered country of the world over. You know. So, uh, in 1964, the Administrative Reforms Commission made a recommendation to the government of India at that point of time to create a, create a post called the Ombudsman Post and even suggested the post be called the Lokpal at the center and Lok Ayuts at the state. Very unfortunately, neither the central government nor any one of the state governments took that advice. Obviously, because they had their own uh, suspicion how this institution will function if such independent powers were given. 1983 in Karnataka, for the first time, a non-Congress government came to power. And that was uh, headed by a party called Janta Party. And uh, uh, the chief minister um, uh, who became leader of the party was one Mr. Ramakrishna Ide, no relative of mine. We were coming to a different community altogether. And, but then I had the privilege of becoming the advocate general under that regime uh, because I happened to fight for the detainees during emergency during 1975 and 77 when there was a declaration of emergen uh, emergency in India. Well, it is during that period that when that election was going on in 1983, Janta Party published a manifesto which said, if we are elected, we will give you a value-based governance. <coughs> Whether because of that promise or otherwise, uh, this party came to power. And about six months, there was no change whatsoever. And then started, intelligentsia started asking questions, what's the difference between you and the previous government? What is that value-based governance that you are giving us? <coughs> it's at that point of time, the government of the day got the report of the Administrative Reforms Commission, which was submitted in 1964 to the government of India, and verbatim implemented as a law of the state and appointed uh, a Lokayukta institution, and uh, created the Lokayukta um, uh, post also as a thing. And all. But for various reasons, uh, uh, Maybe, I'm not a parochial person, I, I don't consider myself as a Kannadiga, means I'm only from Karnataka, I'm not part of India. But for maybe, the, in reality what happened was, uh, people who headed that institution came from different parts of India. Uh, they were not able to uh, converse in the local language and also carried that ha hello, that I'm a judge, I will not meet anybody. Uh, if anything, any complaint is there, you please go and give it in the registry and we will look into that complaint. You know, that was the attitude which uh, never made that institution either popular or uh, really effective in the sense of that. Well, having been an advocate general, I knew the object for which that institution was created. So when I got an opportunity to become the Lokayukta in uh, 2000, uh, <coughs> retired in 2000, 2006, I became the Lokayukta for five years. You know. I threw open the institution for public access, I gave access to the, the public and all, and started uh, listening to the complaints of the people when I realized the real, real deficiency in administration. It could be corruption, it could be arrogance of power. Ultimately, the people of Karnataka did suffer from our administration, which must have been, according to me, in my opinion. Uh, must have been there in other states also, but then there was no such ombudsman. Maybe a little later, Madhya Pradesh started that institution. <coughs> Thereafter, when the institution became very popular uh, in other states, various states also introduced it, but then they didn't give the necessary powers or infrastructure to that institution, then they didn't function as it did in Karnataka. I think. Coming to Karnataka institution, I was trying to analyze why this type of maladministration or corruption is there in the administration. Then I realized, I hope I'm correct, I'm still, I hold that um, opinion, that I don't blame people, the individuals anymore. It's the society in which we are. 
I feel today that we live in a society which respects money and power only, nothing else. Honesty has no meaning whatsoever. <coughs> Loosely they speak about an honest man. Useless chap, he doesn't take money, he doesn't allow others to take money. That's the concept of honesty today. And you talk to them about, look, don't be corrupt, and you're corrupt. Look, I'm corrupt. Are you not corrupt? And you have to, the man has no answer to it. You know. If he's not corrupt, possibly he hasn't had an opportunity of becoming corrupt. That also could be one of the reasons. We said, because I've seen people who fought for corruption, when they came to power, they have become corrupt. And I don't want to name the parties. Every one of you must be reading about it and all of it, whichever political party it is in the thing. Yeah. Then, I, now we have realized that uh, it's basically our forefathers had uh, established so many values in our society for peace and solidarity in the society, which is now vanishing. If not, it's totally disappeared in the thing. Now, because of that, I realized, I'm not a philosopher, I'm not a sannyasi, I'm just an ordinary man, but with little more experience than many of you would have had that experience at least two values, if we can inculcate, we can rebuild that society to what, which comparable to what it was say about 50, 60, 70 years back and all. One is contentment in life, what we call tripti in vernacular. You have contentment, you don't get a disease called greed. Now, so far as greed is concerned, there are proof in our country. What is the growth of greed in our country? There was a scam in the decade of 50s, many of you might have heard about the Jeep scam. Country lost 52 lakhs of rupees in purchasing Jeep vehicles from Great Britain for Indian soldiers. Then thereafter, every year, one or two scams came to the public domain. All scams don't come to the public domain. Out of 10, maybe one or two comes out in a year. There was the Mundra scam of LIC, Dalmia scam of Bharat Bank, Nagarwala scam of Central Bank. When such like scams came, the number of zeros in the figure involved in that scam started developing. I'm del deliberately using the word developing and all this. Come to the decade of 80s, we had a scam called the Bofus. Country lost 64 crores of rupees in purchasing weapons for the Indian Army. Let's jump the thing, we don't have time and all. Come to 2010, two scams came to public domain. Commonwealth Games. Country lost 70,000 crores of Please believe it or not, it's not my figure. It's the figure given to the government of India by a constitutional authority called CAG. He said in Commonwealth Games, country lost 70,000 crores. Same year, 2G, Spectrum scam. Country lost 1,76,000 crores. 2012, we had Colgate, the coal scam. 1,86,000 crores. Compare this figure and the effect of it on the economy of the country. In 1985, then the Prime Minister of India, late Rajiv Gandhi, in a public statement had stated that out of one rupee the government gives for any development or for any beneficiary, only 15 paise reaches development. Out of one rupee. We are in 2019, greed has not come down, it has only increased. In my assessment, which I had facts and figures at my disposal, out of 10 rupees will 15 paise reach the project too. That is the state of affairs. Of course there is development. I'm not saying there is no development. There is development. But if all the money earmarked for the development, where to go to the project concerned? Imagine what would have been the country's development. Now it is in this background I would like you to understand what is happening in the administration. Way back in 1946, in anticipation of independence to this country, our elders created a body called the Constituent Assembly. That assembly functioned from 1946 to 1949. Well, the object of the assembly was to create a constitution for this country, and they prepared a wonderful constitution, which in, on the 26th of January, 1950, we, the people, accepted that as a document, not a politician, not a leader. Please read the preamble of the Constitution, which says, we, the people of India, we adopt this Constitution. That, the, in the discussion, two things took place. I want you to give, uh, my, give you that in the instances for you to understand what was the responsibility of an institution like the Constitution Assembly. The first thing was, 
what type of a political system that this country should have when uh, it, it became uh, independent you know, political system. Internationally, there were many political systems. So there, there was the uh, monarchy, there was dictatorship, there was ism-based politics like communism, socialism, capitalism. I always pleaded that we Indians were never ever independent. We were under the rules of rajas, maharajas, zamindars, foreigners. They made the laws they liked, and perforce we had to follow that law. Otherwise, we are punished. It's in that background they pleaded, let's adopt a political system by which every Indian feels this governance is mine, by me, for me. And that was the definition of democracy at that point in time. Government of the people, by the people, for the people. And our elders accepted that as the, uh, as the political system of this country. A little later, when, while discussing the effect of democracy, another issue came for discussion. The discussion was on the topic that after we adopted democracy as the political system of the country, whether a person who wanted to contest on a constituency should have any educational qualification or not. Many elders, including Baba Sahib Ambedkar said, a person who wants to contest my constituency must have the capacity to understand the problems of that constituency. He must have the capacity to find a solution to that problem, take the problem to the parliament or the legislature, discuss there, and get the necessary infrastructure uh, to solve that problem. For that, they said, there is a need for some educational qualification. The editor of the Constituent Assembly debate writes, practically majority of the people were expressing their view, yes, there should be educational qualification. This is 1946-1947. A little later, one man stood up and addressed the chair and he said, President, sir, then the Speaker of the House was called the President, uh, sir, recently we adopted democracy as the political system of this country and you said the meaning of the word democracy is government of the people, by the people, for the people. Today, sir, he said, the population of this country is 40 crores. Out of 40 crores, 80% are total illiterates. Sir, are you reserving this democracy for 20% of the electorates? He asked the question. The house became stunned, I believe. Nobody could answer that person. A little later, Baba Sahib Ambedkar stood up and addressed the house. He said, I am sorry, please forgive me. I did not look at this problem from the point of view with which the honorable member is saying. He's right. We can't reserve democracy for any class of people. It is the birthright of every Indian and the resolution was dropped. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm giving you this example for you to compare what's happening in the present day successor institution called the parliament or the state legislature. 2016, the Lok Sabha was to meet for 14 days. Not one day discussion took place. Not one day out of 14 days. There was Galata, they came to the well of the house, they walked out of the house, the speaker is in the house. Times of India says one day's Parliament Lok Sabha cost is 10 crores of rupees. Handsomely paid. Have a pension. They have all the perks which you can imagine. I'm not cribbing that. But what's that happening? There's a magazine called Election Watch which audited the performance of the elected representatives of the Lok Sabha from 2004 to 2009. Out of 543 members, those who spoke once in the parliament for five years, were only 174. This is our first pillar of the constitution. <coughs> it's not that the falling values is affected only the parliament. Take the second pillar of the constitution called the executive. When the creation of executive was being discussed, many elders said, they are the future administrators. Let's choose the best of them. Let there be the best of qualification for them. Let there be no influence from the political system. Let's have independent bodies. So they created the public service commissions to choose the best of them. What's happened to these commissions? Two years back, Karnataka CID filed a charge sheet against the immediate past Public Service Commission chairman. Think how much money he and his members have taken for giving a post. Now here is a man who pays money and comes with a public job. He's going to be honest. 
Every scam that has taken place in this country, there is the hand of at least one or two public servants. Others which there can be no scam because under the Indian constitution, any order can be signed only by an executive, not by an elected representative. This is the second pillar of the constitution. Third pillar of the constitution, Mr. Kandila wanted me to speak about it or not. I served that institution for over 50 years. What's happened? One case which has to be disposed of in the system in which we are. There's a trial court, there's a first appellate court, there's a second appellate court, there's a high court, there's a supreme court. I've spoken publicly in India about that. You know. When does the case get over? It's jocularly said, husband and wife have a fight. Husband is 25 years old, wife is 20 years old, one of them goes to the court for restitution of conjugal rights. By the time the final judgment comes, husband will be 85 years old, the wife will be 80 years old. I'm not joking, this is the reality. There's a gentleman here who has a complaint about that. Why can't we change the system? Take your system. We are following British system. You have a system in the United States, the judiciary, where American Supreme Court does not hear matrimonial cases or any property matter. It hears only the interpretation of the American Constitution, which is far and few because it already would have been designed in the last so many decades. Whereas Indian Supreme Court takes the same rent control case after 50 years. <laughs> there is speculative litigation. So much so, now it is said that in cities like Mumbai, Delhi, underground people have taken over disposal of judicial service system. They say, give us the money. You want the tenant to be thrown out? We'll settle it. They said, tell the tenant, if you don't make it, we'll throw acid on your daughter, we'll kidnap your son. Justice immediate. <laughs> but that is not the judicial system we are looking forward to. Why can't we change it? There's a question asked, why does the Supreme Court of India or the courts of India should have a summer vacation of two months or one and a half months or 30 days? What for? The other, other administrative systems don't have that one it is. Yes, I asked the question myself. This was discussed when I was a judge. Those were the days when the Supreme Court went and uh, worked for 210 days in a year. Now they have increased it. Now they work for 250 days in a year. Because they don't want this type of allegation to come. But that's not enough. Even why do you have the other holidays? Why do you have so many fora? Is it necessary? You think, after all, the first court judge is a human being, he might have made an error. You want to rectify it? Have one more forum like you have, a forum like you have in the United States. And that's the end of it. Why do you have a third court, the fourth court, the Supreme Court, the High Court? How do you know they will do the injustice? It's also handled by the same human being. But we are not bothered about that. We don't want to change the system. The people in the system don't want to change it. People who are in the administration don't want to change it. Coming a little further because the question, I mean, a suggestion had come, I'll answer the questions if you people are asking. What's happened recently in the Indian Supreme Court? There was an allegation against the Chief Justice of India, molestation. He creates a bench which he presides over the bench. <laughs> a concept which is fundamental to judiciary, which says that thou shalt not be a judge in your own cause. Okay. He backed out from that. He brought another person into the bench. And what did that bench do? That lady is not a law, a law graduate or a lawyer. She asked for a legal assistance, which is a fundamental right in Article 21 of the Constitution because it is laid down by the previous judgment to the Supreme Court. When she asked for a uh, saying, um, legal assistance, they said, no, this is a private investigating body. We are not giving you that opportunity. So she walked out. They gave a judgment, whatever it is, I'm not going to question that, wherein uh, the Chief Justice exonerated, fair enough. But they didn't give a copy of the judgment to that lady, but they gave it to the Chief Justice. When asked, why did they give it to the Chief Justice? Oh, he's the Chief Justice of India. We didn't give it to him as Mr. So-and-so. What's the meaning of that? I have openly spoken. I have agreed with four other judges to sign a representation, which will be in public domain shortly. So there's nothing that I come outside India and spoken. I've spoken in India. But I didn't want to speak it here and all, but somebody wanted to have to speak because we are all Indians, originally or otherwise and all. This is the judicial system. 
Now let us see what is the consequences of loss of these moral values. 2008, a handicapped tailor came to me with his wife and a six-month-old child. I asked, what's the problem? He said, sir, this child looks perfectly all right. This child has no rectum. It eats through the mouth, defecates through the mouth. The local doctor said, don't worry, this is not an unknown medical phenomenon. Take the child to a speciality hospital where a pediatric surgeon will rectify the deficiency. They believed that took the child to a government medical college hospital. And the pediatric surgeon examines the child and says, oh, I'll get it done, no problem. But it'll cost you some money. Now, money is not expenses, money is bribe. Poor people from a village, they have about a few hundred rupees which they give. He collects that money, puts it in his pocket, and he says, for this money, I'll make a hole near the rib cage from where the fecal mantis will go out. Child has to wear a bag because child will have no control over it. Right through life. Ladies and gentlemen, look at this. He must have prayed to God, give me education. Make me a doctor, make me a pediatric surgeon. God gave everything, comes and joins the government hospital, which in my opinion, at least in Karnataka, is meant for the poorest of the poor. There comes a child, six months old, and he had the capacity to give a future to that child. He was drawing 60,000 rupees at that point of time per month. He had the opportunity of giving a future to that child. His greed didn't turn up. We didn't take the child to another government hospital. We took the child to a private hospital where I was getting treated. I begged of the doctors, they come from my same district as I come from, and they did it. Today that child is nine years old, studying in fifth standard. No bag, no nothing. We were in recently in a place called Bijapur. Sorry? Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, Bijapur, we went, my wife was also there. The parents had come there. This is the child. They wanted us to visit their house. We visited them. But look at the pleasure it gives when we just do our job as a human being. There's a, I can give you hundreds and hundreds of examples of that. You know, uh, one day, a lady came, over 80, 85 years old, with a physically challenged son. What's the problem, madam? Yes, sir, I don't have income. This son has no income. I have one son in Mumbai. He sends me 250 rupees by money order. Postman wants 10% of that. Don't give 10% to him. Address he not found in three visits. Money goes back. Now, postman didn't come within my jurisdiction. So I rang up the CBI chief of the local uh, Karnataka, told him to please help this lady. He must have calculated 250 rupees, 10%, 25 rupees. He tells me, sir, 25 rupees case, sir. I have my officers very busy investigating crows and crows of these scams. I have no time. You do it yourself. Look at this. Postmen in India don't get transferred. They are the same locality unless he's promoted or something. He has seen this lady for decades together. He has seen her life and everything. Still, he must collect his 25 rupees. Here is an officer who is empowered to control that. For him, status of office. He doesn't do 25 rupees cases. Did he understand how much this woman for her 25 rupees is? Ladies and gentlemen, that's what I saw. That's what made me change. That's the reason I have visited more than 1,170 educational institutions, <coughs> hoping that I could tell these stories, and I have enough of them, that I can continue to give the stories to you all. Uh, one is more heart-rendering than the other. Thing. That to inculcate a little bit of, we all think we are human beings born. No, there is no species called uh, human beings. We are born to a species called Homo sapiens, which has nothing to do with humanism. 
Humanism is a value our elders created for peace and solidarity in the society. And we can't claim um, um, say right over that uh, word, the humanism, unless you have humanism in you. Contentment. We have lived through our lives with what we have earned. We have not inherited properties from our parents or anything, and none of us have become millionaires. But I could have. Uh, I could have taken a milk of crab jar, and I could have if I wanted to. But it gives us a great bit of satisfaction in life. Gives me a great bit of satisfaction to express it before you people. If I had done anything wrong, when I named three chief ministers, and one of them was a sitting chief minister, went to jail for 28 days, of course he got acquitted later, that's different. They would have stripped me naked in the streets. They couldn't do that, because there was nothing they could do. I speak about it every day. Last ladies and gentlemen, this is my experience in Karnataka Lokaita. I'm prepared to take uh, questions, or maybe another 15, 20 minutes, whichever is the outer limit you have. My dad retired in um, 89 uh, from Air India. His PF is not yet paid, and he's been kind of fighting similar system for 30 years. And uh, there have been multiple court cases, there have been judgment, but since it is a larger firm, they do not uh, kind of uh, give the money. It's a paltry at today's date, is a two lakh uh, sum. But since the case has been 30 years, He's now 86, um, he cannot see well, he's got a hip replacement. He's um, uh, asked the judge to consider him as a senior citizen. The court system that you talked about is funny how these cases, and he's not alone with it, there are some five people who are in the similar state. We are not able to circumvent this situation because this case always happens to land up in a judge who is going to retire in three to six months. And in that entire case of his history, the 30 years, he must have seen more than 30 or more than that number judges itself. Um, what, with, with your experience, how does a person, I mean, he's a citizen of India, and you know, my brothers as well as the rest of the family are Indian citizens. We've tried to kind of take help with political as well as you know, non-profit organizations. How does one circumvent this particular situation? Which, which state is this, sir? Mumbai. City of Mumbai. There is a judgment of the Supreme Court which says cases pertaining to senior citizens should be taken out of turn. Uh, very unfortunate that in the case in which your father is involved, uh, that uh, the direction or mandate of the Supreme Court is not followed. If somebody could persuade your lawyer to take up the matter by way of a revision petition to the High Court and make a representation there, I'm sure that lawyer will know which is the citation which is immediately relevant, but I can find it out and give it to you if you want the thing. Uh, I can cite that judgment in the higher court and say this judge mandate of the Supreme Court is not being followed. I'm so many years old and my case is pending for such a long time and it's uh, which was worth two lakhs at that point of time, which is not even worth 2,000 to this context and all because rupee value has come down to that. All these things I've explained. I hope the High Court judge at least will understand and uh, will give an out of turn hearing to the matter. He's bound to do that. That's my understanding of law. Because any direction of the Supreme Court and Article 141 of the Constitution is the law of the land, which has to be followed by the courts. Possible that your lawyer uh, in the trial court has not yet moved the matter in, the, in that background and brought to the notice of the court that preference should be given to that, you know. Possible the judge has not understood it, you know. The only way out is to take the matter to a higher court and uh, get an intervention from the higher court, uh, which I hope uh, will understand the possibility. Anybody should understand. Otherwise, there is a saying, justice delayed is justice denied. Of course, if you tell that to a judge, he will say justice hurried is justice buried, you know. 
But I, I hope uh, in a situation like this, uh, somebody will understand the, uh, the sad part of it and do something about it. That's the only way out. I don't find anything else. All right, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Just to say today, what my experience is, my husband fought a battle in this kind of thing because he was the person who was against corruption. I mean, like that's how he was. He didn't learn that what is the time and he should at least be quiet. If he doesn't <coughs> uh, like corruption, it's okay. He would have been quiet, but he was not. So he suffered. Uh, I mean, a miserable fight. He went to Supreme Court. Everything was done like, as you said, the justice delay. 35 years, you can think of. And later, we found out that our own uh, um, lawyer. lawyer was bribed. By. So this kind of things are happening. Mm -hmm. This kind of things are happening. The Supreme Court gave the justice after 35 years. He was on his deathbed. And just two months before his death, it was the same judgment what the, what the Karnataka High Court gave. So there was no change. So was it in favor of your father or against you? Husband. Husband. My husband was fighting the institution. And Justice Hegre, our Karnataka is worse than any other. My experience comes from there already. Yeah. So whatever I said. So it's, it is terrible. It is heartbreaking.